Welcome back. The perception that the pandemic is over is understandable but misguided. Now, this is according to the World Health Organization, even as it reports that COVID-19 infections and fatalities appear to be declining in most places. For more on the situation, I have Professor Zhang Gisak from Halim University. Professor Zhang, welcome back. Good afternoon. I also have Professor Mu Yong Yen at Cheng Sin General Hospital over in Taiwan, live on the line. Professor Yen, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Right. We'll start here in the studio with Professor Chong then. Let's start with a rather disturbing finding over in South Africa. I understand officials there recently talked about a fifth wave of COVID-19 over in South Africa, despite the population, 97% of the population there, possessing antibodies from prior infections, vaccinations, or even both. Professor Chong, what does this finding tell us about the risks of reinfection and perhaps a resurgence here in South Korea? Yes, reinfection exists, and once you get an infection, it does not guarantee uh, the prevention of reinfection. But the rate is very low. Uh, the reason why uh, people get reinfected is because antibody level wanes, whether they have got the, uh, antibody from previous infection or from uh, vaccination. And there could be an infection from a variant, and some people have no immunity at all uh, from the beginning, whether they got an infection or they got a vaccination. So, uh, but we have uh, definitely our data uh, regarding a reinfection. I'll, I'll show you later. Right. And Dr. Yen, then, do start by sharing with us a bit about the COVID 19 situation there in Taiwan. Okay, uh, Taiwan has been playing quite well in the past two years because we have prepared us for two, nearly 20 years. But as you know, recently we have suffered from a uh, only Omicron tsunami, and for the past two months, we had, uh, however, we had passed the peak recently and started to toward working toward the to live with the COVID like Korean do right now. Um, I think Taiwan has a benefit in uh, well preparedness and uh, with surge capacity in the medical system response and the so called uh, traffic control boundary to protect the healthcare systems. And the weakness uh, of the Omicron it was that um, we are lacking uh, the, the, the mild cases all crashed, uh, overwhelmingly crashed the emergency department. And we are lacking the testing uh, capacity. However, we had successfully divided and triaged the, the patient, the mild cases into a community through a, a community screening center into the uh, like a, a primary care physician and and home cares, so uh, we are doing uh, quite stable and improving improving right now. Yeah. Right. Well, that is good to know then, Professor Chang. With regard to reinfections that we spoke about earlier, what does data tell us about the severity of reinfections? Well, as I said before, we have uh, data from case KDCA, and they searched uh, from the beginning of uh, 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 pandemic. Uh, January 2020 and until this year, March. So they found 26,000 reinfected patients uh, in, in our country. And luckily, the severity was very low, 50% uh, lower than uh, a primary infection. Uh, the, the statistics show us 0.06% of uh, mortality and 0.1% of uh, severity transition rate. This is ab around 50% lower. That is it. It's a matter of course because uh, once you, inf you get an infection, the antibody you have uh, in your body, but even though the level is very low, uh, they can cover a certain uh, degree of uh, severity and uh, again, the f uh, fatality. Uh, and uh, many people have uh, a vaccine already and they have artificial antibody, uh, whether they have uh, uh, infection or not. And these days we have uh, uh, seen uh, a very low virulence uh, variants like Omicron. So put all together, uh, the prevalence rate of reinfection uh, in our country is less than 0.5%. Uh, so uh, one out of uh, 500 uh, will be infected uh, sooner or later. But uh, maybe uh, we have a more of uh, infected uh, people in our country than the reinfection uh, rate will be lower and lower because uh, we have uh, repeated uh, vaccination, booster shot, and the repeated infection, and etc. Right, hopefully that will be the case. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yen, based on your understanding of COVID-19, how 
long does immunity from a prior COVID-19 infection appear to last? That is a very complicated question. As uh, Professor Zhong just mentioned, uh, it's uh, been, it has been an interaction, a very complex, a complex of inter interaction between uh, infection, natural infection, repeated infections, and vaccination and repeated boosting. So in general, we know that uh, the immunity, the, the uh, antibody, the immunity will last uh, uh, six months to nine months. I mean, if you, we put uh, the B cell, T cell, and memory cell immunity all together, they will last for nine months. But uh, when people are considering the antibody response against the COVID-19, they always, almost they thought about the neutral antibody only. And that's, uh, so in, in this regard, the, the repeated boosting vaccination strategy has been dominant around the world. So I would say that um, in this, the, the antibody response will last for three to six months, okay? When we're looking for the uh, new variant, viral variants, mutations, and the repeated boosting and the waning effect of the antibody response. In addition, I think the uh, novel mRNA vaccine uh, had evoked the T cell uh, immunity and will possibly causing some so-called T cell exhaustion. That will also uh, waste the uh, uh, shortening the, the effect of the vaccination boosting, I mean, shortening the antibody response effect. Right, I see. And against that backdrop then, Professor Chang, simply speaking, is it better to seek protection through infection then rather than vaccination? What are your thoughts? No, the, once you get an infection, you have to suffer uh, from, uh, from the disease. So avoidance is the best policy, uh, even in the battle. So in, in the battle with uh, disease, uh, you have to avoid, you need to avoid, avoid the disease itself. You get, in, you get infected, you are suffering from uh, various symptoms. Uh, you have a fear uh, to maybe you, you, you end up with uh, ICUs and maybe uh, you might be dying from those diseases. And upon that, uh, once you get a vaccination, <coughs> And you, you have a, a, a not low chance of getting infected uh, once you have a, a vaccination, but the severity is lower and case fatality is far lower once you get a vaccination. So there's no reason why you cannot be vaccinated. So uh, maybe this autumn uh, we'll have another type of uh, vaccination. Uh, Moderna is developing bivalent vaccine. Uh, which has uh, two different types. One is Delta and the other one is Omicron. Uh, luckily, still uh, globally, we have still on an Omicron uh, era. Uh, many people uh, thought that maybe uh, another variant will be coming in, in June or July, but still uh, there is no evidence of uh, new variants. And Omicron is highly transmissible, so it, high enough uh, to, uh, to to, uh, to, be, to not be passed by an, another variant. So uh, if the Omicron will be the dominant uh, variant until the uh, uh, coming uh, autumn and winter, then we'll be uh, protected by a bivalent vaccine with Omicron and Delta. Delta is a very virulent one. So uh, by that time, you need to get a vaccination definitely, and you can lower the severity, and you can avoid from the infection, and also lower the fatality. Right. And Dr. Yen, come June 20th, that would be next Monday, quarantine, mandatory quarantine for COVID-19 patients here in South Korea may be lifted. That being said, generally speaking, what are your thoughts on the wisdom of this possible lifting of quarantine for COVID-19 patients? Yeah, to live with COVID uh, needs wisdom indeed. And I, I, I support your decision, and that is a wise, wise decision to uh, open your border, because uh, with a mild, uh, milder form of uh, Omicron and the wide coverage of the antibody response, I think the time, the days of uh, testing and quarantines also of asymptomatic cases is, is over. So, um, and I think your, your, your government has uh, doing a very wise decision. And as, as a matter of fact, Taiwan is approaching to open the border, on the way to uh, open the border, but the, we need to pass through the Omicron tsunami first. And you know that South Korea was listed as the second most popular tourist country for Taiwanese. 
and you can take comfort that the Taiwanese people are very disciplined in uh, wearing masks and uh, alcohol-based hand hygiene. So uh, I think it's very good for the uh, tourists between two countries. Right. But at the moment, Professor Yen, over in, uh, Dr. Yen, over in Taiwan, the quarantine for travelers still remains in place there, right? The seven-day quarantine for inbound travelers. Um, yeah, the seven-day quarantine policy uh, will be changed to three plus four, which means you need three days uh, quarantine and four days of self-management. Yeah. I see. All right, Professor Zhang, back here on the local front, temporary COVID-19 screening centers have been shut down and uh, those suspected of having COVID-19 are now required to visit public health centers to get tested. How does this closure, Professor Zhang, uh, look to affect Korea's containment efforts? Well, I don't think it affects a lot because uh, it is a bit inconvenient and people will not get tested and uh, maybe a, a silent infection will be spreading or people will be uh, uh, suffering from uh, COVID-19 at a later phase because they didn't uh, get uh, uh, diagnosis. But this time, it's the disease itself is very mild and getting milder and milder. And rapid antigen test is always available in any private clinic, uh, most private clinic. And over 60 and older elderly uh, uh, people uh, the health center is open and uh, most of uh, people who are over 60 have uh, some time or enough time to, to visit to get PCR test, which is the most correct one. So I don't think it's, it will affect a lot uh, in, in the containment uh, uh, policy. So, and whenever it is necessary, uh, the government can open uh, anytime the temporary screening center. On maybe next surge and before the surge, uh, the primary care clinic and the neighboring hospital will be all participating in, in the, the diagnosis and also the treatment. So I don't care much about that. Right. So Professor Zhang, you do believe that there will be another surge then? Sure, maybe probably possibly in early autumn or more probably uh, early winter because uh, as Dr. Yan said, the antibody uh, wanes in six months time after infection and after vaccination, antibiotics uh, last only two or three months. So you have a second booster, first booster, uh, the, 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 the effective antibody level ends by uh, August. And we have uh, lots of uh, more than 10 million people uh, got infected from January to uh, March and, and early April. And all the antibodies uh, goes, uh, wane, keep waning, waning, and then maybe uh, end of September, uh, most people will not uh, have enough antibody about that. So if uh, virus spreads in, the, in, in our society, then we'll have uh, another surge uh, right. by that time. Right, I see. Hopefully it wouldn't be too bad then. Dr. Yan, long COVID appears to have been extensively documented over in the U.S. Does Taiwan have its own data on this post-COVID syndrome? Okay, I think uh, in Taiwan, uh, the data is not as many as 10, 10 to 20% as the world reports of the Western countries, because um, we have so many cases, so so little cases before. So uh, actually, in uh, January we do have that kind of case, but less than five percent generally. And in this year, we had uh, by now we have uh, more than two million cases in two months. But we still need times to observe and follow up what's going on. But uh, we need to collect the, uh, to to propaganda for the awareness of long COVID and surveillance and reporting to gather more information to follow up in the, uh, for the policy to make in the future. But however, we should develop an integrated care model and clinics coordinating different medical specialists in different departments to provide a holistic support uh, for, for the patient care. We can call that would be the new epidemic in the future. Right, long COVID, of course, then. Professor Zhang, I hear young adults account for quite a portion of recent infections here in South Korea. Do you care to explain? Yeah, the proportion have shifted from elderly to uh, younger. But I think it's not a bad uh, phenomenon because uh, we are now time to, uh, to uh, uh, go for a mitigation strategy. That means uh, sufficient or uh, adequate exposure uh, for younger and healthy others to uh, viruses. And those young, uh, young and healthy people uh, have a mild symptom and have an antibody. 
and they do not spread uh, virus anymore for time being, less, let's say that it's six months, then uh, they have a lower chance to transmit to uh, elderly people. So uh, we, we need to protect the elderly people uh, uh, very intensively, and we need a fast track, and a new government is going to do a fast track. But by doing that, we can lower the severity and lower the, lower the case fatality. That if the case fatality is very low, no one will be very afraid of uh, 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 any COVID-19. So uh, gradual exposure and uh, uh, some uh, limited exposure will be necessary for young, young healthy adults. Right, of course. Dr. Yen, across the border over in North Korea, as of this past Monday, <laughs> the country has reported more than 4 million suspected cases of COVID-19 and 71 related fatalities. What are your thoughts on these tallies, Dr. Yen? Yeah, from the data, I would say that ESA is making the world record for the COVID-19 pandemic or largely underestimated of the, the cases due to the issue of uh, transparency in the information sharing. And um, most of all from the media, I learned that North Korea has only limited uh, testing capacity and depends on many on the symptomatic diagnosis. And that would left nearly half of the asymptomatic cases unidentified. So um, I think it's more rational to examine the ex excess death to compare the data with previous years before we can jump into a definite conclusion. Right, of course. And staying with the situation in North Korea, Professor Zhang, what medical support do you believe is of utmost importance to this country should it decide to accept our help? Well, we need a comprehensive support uh, if they need, they require. But first of all, I would like to emphasize the vaccine again because uh, Prevention is best policy, uh, not to get a disease. Once you get a disease, uh, maybe uh, many people in North Korea uh, have uh, lower nutritional level and lower uh, chronic disease and, and etc. But in that case, if you diagnose late, uh, no kind of uh, drug uh, can be effective. So vaccination is most effective. And, uh, luckily, uh, we have uh, lots of vaccines uh, in our country. And globally, uh, overproduction of a vaccine, vaccine is well known. So uh, either from our country or from other uh, globally, uh, uh, we should provide a vaccine first. But uh, again, the antiviral agent uh, should be supplied uh, for a very uh, severely ill patients uh, and early phase. And like uh, we do in our hospital, uh, we, uh, they maybe need a ventilator, artificial uh, uh, ventilation. Uh, because uh, we, in Korea, we do not have uh, uh, me, uh, e enough uh, ventilator in Korea, uh, but uh, we have to uh, uh, supply uh, for, for themselves. And uh, another one is maybe IV fluids like amino acid and the, uh, 5 percent uh, uh, distilled water with the uh, glucose in, in it and, and etc. And finally, uh, maybe they need a rapid antigen test kit or some PCR tests uh, to, to diagnose early and to, to get people uh, in an early phase treatment. Right, of course. And Dr. Yen, what, I understand this is going to be a difficult question, but what do you suppose will be the end game with regard to this pandemic? Okay, the most major lesson learned we've learned from the COVID pandemic up to now is that the vaccination alone is not enough to stop the pandemic. Instead, I see that the vaccination has become the driving force of the mutation of the COVID virus. So, um, and in that way, we have to use more and more boosting doses. And generally, we call this a balloon squeezing effect. We saw that in the antibiotic control as well. The more antibiotics, the more antibiotic you are using, then you would develop more resistant strain. So, and you can see this kind of a balloon squeezing effect. Now, the uh, the latest data was up to the Middle East and the Southeast Asia, as Taiwan has been involved as well. In addition, the in the West Bank of the America is still to stir in again. So, uh, just as uh, Professor Zhang just said, uh, um, we uh, should expect some more resurgence of the variant. Okay, so a new normal is needed to uh, to change human behavior. I think that will be the most important lesson that uh, COVID-19 taught us. So we should humbly wearing a mask, practice hand hygiene, and to tame the new coronavirus, okay? 
can wait for the next generation. Uh, it's more safer and more pro broadly published uh, vaccine. And hopefully we can see the end game in 2023. <laughs> right, next year. I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. All right, Dr. Yen, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Professor Zhang here in the studio, thank you very much for your insights. My pleasure. Thank you both.